Ladies and gentlemen, the time is 6.03. We have the presence of a quorum this evening, and this meeting has been duly called in the time and manner prescribed by law. We're here for a presentation on uh, academic efforts at uh, Briargate, and then an agenda review of our next week's board meeting. Mr. Dupree. Thank you, Mr. Rice. We're going to begin um, discussing Briargate Elementary this morning. We're going to hear a report, and then we'll open the floor for any citizens who would like to provide feedback regarding the plan. Um, our Director of Accountability, Jan Moore, is going to begin the discussion this evening. Hi. Good evening, Board of Trustees, President Rice, Mr. Dupree, staff, and community members. The primary purpose of this hearing is to present the improvement plan for Briargate Elementary and allow for public and board comment. Before we begin the campus presentation, Dr. Rodriguez and I would like to provide some background information. Some districts and campuses in uh, Texas are held accountable in a variety of ways for academic performance and compliance with a multitude of state and federal laws. Academic performance is incorporated into widely publicized state and federal accountability systems and the lesser known performance-based monitoring system. The state system is best known for ratings it assigns to districts and campuses. This system has been completely revamped with the transition from the tax test to the STAR test. In addition to the ratings, the new system allows or awards distinctions to campuses and contains a set of safeguards. You have already received general information regarding our results in the state system. Tonight you will hear more detail about Briargate Elementary's plan that has resulted from their rating of improvement required. In the coming weeks, we will provide you with additional updates on other aspects of our new state system. The performance-based monitoring system encompasses two major components. The performance-based monitoring analysis system, or PBMAS, and the data validation monitoring system, DVM. PBMAS evaluates district performance in federally funded programs, and you will hear a separate update on our PBMAS report later this evening. The federal system is best known for the requirements regarding adequate yearly progress, or AYP. TEA was granted a conditional waiver from federal accountability requirements on September 30th of this year. As a result of this waiver, districts and campuses no longer have to implement interventions and sanctions that may have been required previously due to failing to meet AYP standards. We will devote the remainder of this presentation to the state accountability system. New state accountability ratings were released for the first time on August 8th of this year. These ratings were the first state ratings based on STAR test results. The new system is quite different from the previous system in that it is based on a set of index scores that combine student results in different ways to evaluate different aspects of campus and student performance. This time I'll turn the program over to Dr. Rodriguez who will provide some background information on Briargate status. Good evening Mr. Dupree and board members. So just uh, what causes a campus to be to be IR in the state accountability system. For 2013, campuses were evaluated by their performance on three of four indexes. Elementary and middle school campuses were measured on only indexes one, two, and three, which include student achievement, student progress, and closing performance gaps. Any campus that did not meet the target on any index was labeled improvement required. For 2013, only high schools were evaluated on index four, but next year all campuses will be judged on post-secondary readiness. This slide gives the target scores for each index for 2013. These targets are expected to change for 2014, but haven't been announced yet. Please keep in mind that these new ratings were issued for the first time in August 2013 based on results from the 2012-2013 school year. As you recall, no ratings were released based on the 2011-2012 school year as a new accountability system was under development. IR campuses are required to form a campus leadership team, also known as the CLT. 
The team must include a designated external member trained in the campus improvement process and compensated by the district. The PSPs are proven successful school administrators who work closely with each leadership or each campus leadership team. At this time, I would like to ask our PSP to please stand, Dr. Gary Schumacher. Dr. Gary Schumacher has worked with us over the last several years with other campuses and at the district level and is currently working with Briargate Elementary. We are pleased to report that by implementing the CLT process, all Fort Bend ISD campuses that were rated academically unacceptable in 2011 were rated as met standard in 2013. So at this time, we're going to go ahead and get started with our principal, Valerie Macklin. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Mr. Rice, Mr. Dupree, staff, and community members. Before I share our plan of improvement, it is important for me to share with you our Campus Performance Index Report. Our students met standard in Index 1, Student Achievement, which includes all students in all subject areas. The target score was 50 and Briargate made 59. We also met standard in index two, which looks at the growth students made from year one star to year two star. The target score was 30 and Briargate made 36. However, the campus did not meet standard in index three, which measures the performance of economically disadvantaged student groups along with two lowest performing race ethnic groups. For Briargate, that was the African American student group. Based on the analysis of our data for index three, we see that our strongest area was reading while our weakest areas were writing and science. At Briargate, economically disadvantaged and African American student groups were mostly the same students. So it is not surprising that there is little difference between the results for each group. Now I will share our goals and improvement plan that will address index three. As a part of the CLT process, we identified four needs that our plan must address to improve the areas of low performance. Three of the needs involve increasing the effectiveness of regular classroom instruction by improving student engagement, rigor, and the use of data to improve instruction. The fourth need involves taking steps to improve student behavior in order to maximize learning. We have set a target of at least 60% for the percentage of each of our student groups reaching satisfactory performance on STAR 2013-2014 for this school year. In addition, we have set a goal of reducing discipline referrals for in-school suspension and out-of-school suspension by 25% this year. Our primary strategy to address the need for more effective classroom instruction is to train our teachers in the fundamental five classroom instructional practices and then to utilize each of them in daily, in daily instruction. To begin the year, we have emphasized the concept of framing the lesson in which teachers ensure students know what they are expected to learn. As the year progresses, we will focus on each of the five practices one at a time until all are being utilized effectively. Weekly lesson planning will include the use of a new lesson plan template by all teachers. Our new template provides for increased incorporation of higher level question stems based on Bloom's taxonomy, which, uses, which will be used during classroom instruction. Our goal is to improve instructional rigor and appropriate lesson pacing on a daily basis. This will lead to better student engagement in classroom instruction, resulting in improved learning. Our campus will make better use of student data performance so that we are able to facilitate better data analysis and data analysis discussions to improve our instructional planning. Using data to better inform instructional decisions will improve teacher delivery and planning of tier one instruction. 
Wiregate was already implementing the chance behavior management approach, but we realized that our implementation needed to be more consistent throughout the campus. CHAMPS provides a clear vision for the look, sound, feel, goals, and accomplishments for the classroom and provides an effective management plan that will help teachers to shape our students' behavior. Foundation serves as a similar purpose for the common areas of the building, such as our cafeteria and our hallways. We also realized that several aspects affecting student safety in the neighborhoods surrounding Briargate were promoting stress and misbehavior among our students. To combat these issues, we formed a safety task force to involve community leaders in finding solutions. The most prominent of these solutions is our walking school bus, which allows students to walk home in groups accompanied by adults who we call the bus drivers. In addition, the district installed a fence around our playground so that recess and other outdoor activities are not interrupted by strangers. Now I will turn the microphone back over to Dr. Moore to close our presentation. At the November 11th board meeting, trustees will be asked to approve the school improvement plan for Briargate Elementary. Pending that approval, we will submit to the Texas Education Agency the campus workbook components that are listed on the slides. They have looked at a data analysis, they've done a needs assessment, and they have written their improvement plan. Although we realize this presentation has been rather brief, we hope we have given you a good overview of the goals Briargate will be addressing this year. Our next steps after the plan is approved will be to continue the implementation monitor our progress, report our progress to the state, and make provisions as necessary to ensure continuous improvement. And at this time, we'll be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Do we have any questions? Mr. Rosenthal. Yes, thank you. <coughs> On your, your goal of um, discipline referrals, um, how do you plan to reduce by 25 percent the, the typical, you know, solutions? We are using a more positive behavioral approach to our students. Um, one of the goals that we have in order to reduce that is to allow our students uh, to reinforce each other. So at this time, we have our safety patrol that's uh, able to give out our Jaguar bucks and coupons that have been provided to us by community relations when they see students doing a good job. We call it Catch You Being Fabulous. And we also have our teachers who are able to give out the same incentives when they catch the students being fabulous either in the line, in the classroom, at the restroom. Okay. Valerie, can you mention uh, your store? You were gonna open up a store? Yes, we will be opening up our school store because our students love to buy things. And uh, they will be able to redeem their Jaguar bucks at the st school store weekly. Okay, great. So you're actually not just going to reduce it by 25%, you're actually hoping that we go through, above through all these, these things that, yeah, okay, got it. Great, thank you. Dr. Taylor? There we go. Okay, um, at first I got to come in and then I want to ask you a, a question. Um, you mentioned on index three, um, the score for Briargate was um, 53, but the passing score was 55. So I want to comment, uh, commend you on that great effort. We we're closing the gap there. But I wanted to ask you, is there any particular grade level that we may have to focus on to get to the 55 and higher? Absolutely. Uh, we are focusing on grade three. Uh, grade three is that target grade level for us where we are looking to really uh, hone our efforts there to improve our student achievement. Uh, we're working with them each day, small groups and uh, 
good tier one instruction and for those students who we have utilized the data to see that they may be uh, at least two years below grade level we are pulling them in tier two and tier three groups that ha are being uh, utilized by our teachers with uh, great resources that have been provided by our district okay. <coughs> thank you this is humble yes um couple of things so on the store who will provide the items in the store is that a volunteer thing or you're soliciting from the community a business partner you know actually we utilize <laughs> our, our title one budget there is okay. a portion in title one for student incentives and we'll be utilizing that, those funds for the store okay, okay good um I, I had a question too about um the achievement gap thing i'm not quite clear Who's being compared? Which groups are being compared? That is a great question. Um, and just to let you know, in December, we're going to bring you a full-blown report on the entire accountability system. It's all very new this year. On Index 3, when we're looking at comparing uh, groups, we're looking at economically disadvantaged for every campus and then specifically for each campus it's the lowest two student groups from the previous year so when Valerie mentioned that there uh, most of her students were the same in both of mm -hmm. her two low groups the perceived gap between those two is one percent but we're really talking about those those same students what the state is really wanting us to do is target all kids and if our lowest kids are moving up then we're in good shape the closing of a gap no longer pits this student group against this student group against this one we're just trying to target the previous low performers and make sure they are improving but if those are, are the two lowest populations who are the other populations at Briargate I think we have some Hispanic and some white but they're very very small on that particular campus right so just it, it's a very <laughs> it's a very unique uh, new system that we're all still trying to learn some campuses present themselves with five or six student groups that count others only one and so it's uh it's really difficult how you how the state kind of developed its plan to put that together so the one percent probably equates to a handful of students right that are in one group and not in the other yes mm -hmm. and the uh, fundamental five that y'all y'all have already started that yes we have and is the staff is your staff on board with all the changes and the different you know it's hard to come back to school and then you start some different programs and, and all that I just wondered if they're enthusiastic and really willing to put their best forward I'm sure they were probably putting their best forward anyway um, so I just wonder how they felt about it all well they're awesome and they want to do whatever is best for our students so they were very interested in the fundamental five because it was a great way for us to get back to some basics and we wanted to make sure that we were doing the basics well for the students um, and they have gone through several changes but actually the fundamental five is not too much of a change for what we consider to be best practices and so when you talk about framing the lesson it is something that they already did however now it's posted and it is more visible so that it's colorful in a lot of their rooms they've done a great job you have to come and visit us um, but it's more visible to the children so now with the color coding that they're utilizing that's just a tweak on the already good practices that they were using that I'd like to get out there the last time I was there they were wearing Y'all were all wearing some kind of name tag and you called each other either was it yes. math class you were working on or yes <laughs> yes no, it was really <laughs> yes <laughs> yes i was no longer miss mac and i was 12 times 12 right. 144 right. yes yes i'm thinking about doing that with my grandson yes <laughs> that's a good idea yes. 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 thank you Val. Mm -hmm. but thank you thank you mrs hompom mr albright um on the lesson plan templates are those still being generated by R2D2 or? R2D2. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, 
the new lesson plan template in collaboration with our curriculum department. I work very closely with Susan Vordakis and Ginger. Um, it actually integrates the Fundamental Five and Bloom's questioning, um, and it utilizes the components that our district has put into place. It just allows for the teachers to hone in and focus on what we know are the particulars for our campus, which happens to be asking better questions of our students. We feel that we need to ask better questions of our students to get the kinds of responses that's going to help them to be successful. So it's just kind of tweaking what you already had? Yes, sir. Okay. And then um, on your data, how, how are you using, uh, I know you said that we're going to have a better use of data, which of course and it's coming from the curriculum department, but are, are we still doing data team meetings there? Is that what we're doing? Actually, we use PL, the PLC process where we discuss data as a part of how is this uh, improving learning. If you're looking at your students and you're focused on the curriculum, you're trying to make sure that you're, you're not leaving any child behind. Our goal is to not leave anyone behind. So we take the weekly common formative assessments that we give and we utilize that data to see have our students met the target objective. So it's not so much data teams as really looking at a very uh, narrow focus for the curriculum piece uh, based on our scope and sequence. And for us, that's critical because we want to make sure that our African American sub pop, uh, we're constantly monitoring them mm -hmm. so that we can make sure that if we need to go back and, you know, reteach, reassess, we're able to do that. Um, and be better informed about who we're missing, actually, so that we can pull those small groups and focus instruction. Thank you. This is James. Can, can you, uh, pick, just picking up from Mrs. Holmom's question about um, uh, the uh, improvement in performance, is, is that looking at the same kids from grade, say, grade three to grade four, or is that looking at just grade three as the improvement over last year's grade three? It's Can actually both. Okay. And the reason being is that, one, we look at when we're looking at grade level to grade level, we're looking at apples to apples so that we can see, is it a grade level deficit? Is it something that we need to work on ourselves uh, in our teaching practices? And then we also look at you know, the same students who are in grade three, now in grade four, and how are they maintaining what has been already laid as a foundation so that they are able to move into that grade four curriculum and utilize it effectively. Okay, that sounds great. And then um, I wondered if you could expand a little bit on the monitoring, how you're going to be evaluating what you're doing. Actually, the different, uh, of all, I'm just saying, elaborating just a bit on of all the different, uh, I think, you know, the, you know, the other, other strategies. We have common formative assessments that we call our CFAs that we are generating uh, as a team uh, in collaboration with our curriculum department that sends out helping teachers. Uh, we have a data wall so that when you walk in uh, to our one room, which is uh, monitored by our data specialist, Robert Stewart, uh, you are the teachers actually have each child in their class on a card and it's color coded by teacher. So it's anonymity so that you don't have any student names on the front um, and the way the data wall is set up the teachers move their cards weekly based on their student performance and there's a range of numbers across the top and that's one way at a glance that when we walk in we can see if we have a preponderance of our cards at one end whether let's say it's at a high end we know that they've mastered that and so we can move on and those children that we, like we said, we don't want to leave anyone behind, then we know to pull them in small group in tutorials, which we call our Paul Power Time in the morning, and we monitor with student sheets so that we know that they're making the grade and they're attending. So we have our assessment walls, and then we have our data discussions, and then our teachers, of course, meet on their own to track their children and to discuss them. And they turn in minutes and sign in sheets uh, that they will turn in to me so that I can monitor. And then we do fidelity checks, my assistant principal and I, uh, as we go through and we monitor to see how our kids are doing. And we sit in to talk with our teachers so that we're all on the same page. 
And maybe that would include um, observing some of those higher level questions and oh, things, yes, those types of things. Yes, ma'am. I think another thing I'd like to share with you as well is the team that she has assembled, including our professional service provider, must meet monthly <coughs> and turn in reports to TEA. And so the team's focus is to do the internal monitoring and ask the really tough questions. Okay. Okay, you said you were going to do that. Did it work? How do we know it worked? Where's your evidence? So I think the, the cycle that's going through has Valerie monitoring, her team monitoring, outside professional monitoring, as well as DEA. There's some monitoring. Good, thank you very much. And I have to also say that my assistant superintendent is awesome about coming out and helping us monitor as well. And we, we appreciate her support because she's really knowledgeable in curriculum. <laughs> what I, I do want to say is that I think Valerie is being very modest when she talks about all the things they've implemented. Um, I've been there a lot. And every time that we have conversations, we step back and say, what are some things that we can do based on our observations? And everything that we've said, and we don't say a lot, you know, we want to do one, two, or three things, and she implements it, and it looks fabulous. Uh, last time I told her a little bit about the hallways, I said, we need to tighten the hallways up, what are you thinking? And certainly today, it was really tightened up, so you're being very modest. I, and if I may, can I just say hello to our team back here, about our teachers? Um, Barbara, can we say hello? <laughs> and Dr. Long, thank you for coming from the Rich Theater Pad. This is Bailey. <clears throat> uh, just one question. I noticed that we're putting a lot of, it seems to me, a lot of focus on the teachers again and holding these teachers accountable. And I just want to make sure we take steps, hopefully, that we have a positive climate there and our teachers are actually being supported and helped during, during these changes because it's, 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 it's a lot to ask of them. And I just hope we've, you know, we've got the data walls and the PLCs and I'm just hoping that we create a nice positive experience for those teachers and we work hard to do that so they know they can come to me they get gene passes early leave passes when they do a good job lunch on the principal okay. and they do come to me as well so <laughs> you, yes you do. they stop me in the hallway but we say a lot of positive things and when I visit the classrooms I'm sure and I trying to remember who I saw today I saw a couple of folks today you know just saying what did you think what did you think what did you think and they really want that feedback and it's a lot that they're getting and I know Valerie took me to the teacher's lounge today. Tell me about that. Oh, we have a wall that's called the Paul Pat of Praise so that not only can we give them a pat on the back because we're Jaguar Pauls, so we have our Pauls, um, but they can give each other a pat on the back and teachers give each other pats on the back, administrators, and anyone who comes in and you see something good and you post it on the wall. And sometimes they post them in their rooms and I like that and in the hallways. So we try to make maintain a positive climate because they do work hard and my teachers go way above and beyond the call of duty every day. Thank them. Yes, we do. <laughs> Ms. Blackman, I just had a couple questions. Yes, sir. Do you feel you have all the resources that you need to implement the program? Yes, I do. I have felt a lot of support lots of support and I am very happy with that and we're trying to make sure that we utilize that support effectively. Uh, we have helping teachers at our uh, campus, uh, we have Dr. Rodriguez at our campus and we have our parents that are there and you would be surprised at how helpful that is to have the community involved and have them come in and want to read and be a part of our campus and of course that really helps the teachers and the students so yes we have lots of support you made a comment in your presentation about uh when you were talking about I think improving discipline and I thought I heard you say there was something about a fence around the playground. Is that something you do not have at the present time? 
We have it now. Uh, we, we say that Briargate is a gated community, and uh, it's awesome because it has really helped it has helped so much with our campus climate and environment. Uh, the children feel very safe. The parents love it. Um, and I thank Mr. Dupree for working with me and talking with me to find out the needs of my campus when he first came in as our superintendent. And it was an awesome way for him to show support of our initiatives to provide that safe environment. The teachers love it uh, because when they go out for recess now, they don't have to worry about stray dogs or anything that may come in uh, that is undesirable from the community. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Moore, so uh, I'm just understanding that these ratings just were published in August of this year. So August... Uh, August 8th. August 8th, September 8th, October 8th, so three months ago. And, uh, and this is part of the new state accountability rating system. Correct. And we don't have all of the uh, outcomes from the state yet. Is that correct? Um, we have a rating for the district, which is met standard. Those are the words they chose. Okay. And all of our campuses met standard. And if they did not, they were improvement required. I'm not sure the labels will stay that same way. Uh, they've been talking about in future sessions moving to ABCD for campuses. Uh, I think there's a contingency that still want to get that exemplary recognized label back. Um, so I think for now we're set with met standard and improvement required. Okay, and then the uh, the, the four campuses in 2011 that did that were rated academically unacceptable. I understand they've all moved out, but that was the state rating also. That was, and so when they met standard this year, they came out from underneath their state requirements uh, for improvement. And the same process that is in place um, worked with them, and we feel very optimistic that it will work with Briargate. Very We're well. Almost there. Do we have any other questions? One Mrs. quick Humble? comment: um, When we determine whether all of these uh, programs and initiatives have been successful, which I feel like they certainly should be because they're very exciting, I'd like to hope that we would share these among our other elementary schools because while the others met standard. It might have been, you know, barely, or um, they could use the same kind of assistance. So I'd like to think that we're going to share all the things that Val and her staff are doing over there. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, have we started the CLT team yet? Just yet? We started it already? Yes. And how did you get the members of that group together? How did you go about it? Well, there are a few requirements from the state that there needs to be some campus people, some district people, and then the outside professional service provider. And then we respected Valerie. She nominated people, and based on the needs for her campus, we had representation from curriculum, accountability, superintendent, math specialists. Yes, and specialist. actually, if they could stand the CLT team for Briargate, if you don't mind standing, um, that happens to be uh, Robert Stewart, our data specialist, our assistant principal, Sonia Watson, reading specialist, Lala Bennett, and Cynthia Bello, math specialist, Susan Verdakis, our curriculum per partner, and uh, Zach Bigner. So these are our campus uh, CLT members, along with Dr. Moore and Dr. Rodriguez. Can you give an update how that, go, how that team is going? Anybody want to speak? Don't want everybody speak at one time. Anybody? Okay. All right, I won't put you on the spot. <laughs> well, thank you, Mrs. Ms. Macklin, for a very nice report. And Dr. Moore, thank you. And Mr. Dupree, thank you for your efforts and the administration to moving our district forward. We do appreciate your efforts and all of your efforts in helping our, our students. Thank you. And now I think uh, if there are no other comments, we'll hear public comments from the community if, if anyone has signed up to speak or wishes to speak. Now is the time to come forward.
sir. I'm going to have them um, swap out our presenters at the table. We're going to have um, Beth Martinez come up and give an update on our district planning process. Good evening, everyone. We have a handout Hi. for this. Well, good evening. Okay. Um, this evening, I'm going to provide a summary of uh, everything that has happened with the district strategic planning process since I last visited with you at the October board workshop. And I have to tell you that next week, we will have a visitor with us. Tracy Richter will um, provide a more comprehensive overview and update in what's going on with the strategic planning process. He's our lead facilitator with Dijon Richter, and so he'll be joining us for the board meeting next week. I do have here this evening Scott Leopold from Dijon Richter and David Sturtz from Dijon Richter, and they'll be providing input or answering questions along the way as necessary. Uh, since last month's update, the steering committee met and planned for the community dialogue sessions, which you know occurred last week, uh, two different sessions, one at Elkins and one at Travis. We had over 300 community members who attended. They completed an individual questionnaire and then in their, in their group setting came to consensus or to the greatest extent possible came to consensus over those questions and then posted their responses. I say to the greatest extent possible because uh, there was a lot of discussion around consensus and what does consensus mean and that that's not uh, majority rules or the loudest voice rules but that it is if you can if you have to stand on the table and vehemently oppose then you can't come to consensus and in, in many cases there were very strong beliefs or in, in several cases there were very strong beliefs about some of the questions and people could not come to consensus and so the important thing to remember at that point and what was told to as many as possible is that if, if it is something that you feel like you have to stand on the table and really put your foot down about then provide that feedback in the consensus questionnaire four of the people at the table of six came to consensus but two held strongly to whatever those responses were. So we encouraged those responses and um, had E-team and, and different district folks walking around the room to assist if we could in, in helping to, to um, what am I looking for? Um, facilitate, thank you very much, yes, to facilitate that thank process. You, yeah. Thank you. Um, and to answer questions as we could so that they would feel comfortable in doing that. It's important to know that not only the group consensus questionnaires were submitted and, and reviewed, but also the individual questionnaires. So if, if we weren't able to address that concern or, or help people get on the right track, <laughs> we do have their individual data as well. Um, after the community dialogue sessions, we provided a link to hundreds of community members and if y'all remember the old commercial they told two friends and they told two friends and they told two friends is the idea behind it because we passed the email through multiple distribution lists and through e-blast through the chamber of commerce and, and many different ways and asked people to pass that along to their friends and neighbors and uh, community contacts so that we could pr get input on the online survey after participants watched the video. And as of this afternoon, we had close to 400 responses on the online questionnaire as well. So since, during the community dialogue, and really since the community dialogue, I know some of you have received some concerns. I've heard con some concerns that the process might be able to be hijacked or um, that there could be some special interest groups with special platforms such as zoning, rezoning, um, magnets, programs, and academies. And um, prior to the community dialogue, I talked to a few folks who were concerned that these were zoning or rezoning meetings. And we were able to have some one-on-one some -on -one conversations and encourage them to come out and participate in the process to provide that feedback and jump online if they couldn't after that and provide that feedback online uh, to assure them that their voices would be heard. So even though we've had some of that feedback, and I know there are some concerns about that, um, the flip side of that is that many voices are indicating that, that they feel really confident about the process, that they're pleased with the type 
uh, an amount of information that's being shared throughout the process and the way in which their voices are being heard back both formally and informally. Um, one of the things that I heard at Travis High School actually, the second community dialogue was, you know, I really like that it's not just the squeaky wheel. It's not just that loudest voice. I'm, I'm kind of a quiet person and I'm able to provide my feedback at an individual level or on an individual level and then have a discussion in a structured format with a group. And even though we may not agree, the ability to have that discussion and, and try to come to some type of consensus and then have it noted when I didn't made that person feel more comfortable. So I think there's there's a mix. You know, there's some positive, there's some negative, there's some, some apprehension as well. And, and we continue to, to work through that and provide communication to the greatest extent we can in a, in a common voice to get that feedback. Um, it is truly a sound process. It makes it difficult for the special interest groups to dominate, like I said before, because we're not only reviewing actually Dijon Richter going through and reviewing the individual feedback on those individual questionnaires but also that consensus data as well and the notes that were left on the consensus data. And after each session was over, for those of you who, who weren't in attendance, the groups would go up and post their responses, th their consensus responses. And so we did have really positive feedback about the visual. You know, I was able to really at a glance see where did my group responses fall in relation to the whole and, um, and me as an individual, how does what I feel, sorry, um, look on the wall as everyone posts their responses. I do uh, want to reiterate, as Mr. Dupree has shared often, everyone has a voice and we're going to use that collective voice to provide the recommendations to the board as we move forward. Um, ultimately, there will be multiple opportunities for you all to review the considerations and the data along the way. Uh, this community-based data is going to be used to tell the story. To, to look at what, what does the community as a whole want, both that individual data and the consensus data that I mentioned earlier. So up until this point, through the steering committee process, well, starting back at the Educational Futures Conference, the steering committee process and the community dialogue, the online survey, we've been collecting data, getting information, and that online survey will be open until the 6th, midnight of the 6th, and um, then again, providing that opportunity to get input from the community as we head into the second community dialogue meeting that I'll talk about a little bit more extensively later. Uh, this week, the superintendent's executive team, which is his leadership team, some directors, executive directors, representatives from Dijon Richter, and uh, the Jacobs representatives will meet for two days. We'll be reviewing the Jacobs facility study, the Educational Futures Conference data, the community dialogue session information, and the data that is continuing to come in until the uh, night of the 6th. And during these two days, which are called the options development phase, we will um, work with incorporating two representatives from each of the planning areas. They entered into a lottery and uh, their names were drawn. And so we have two per planning area that will be joining us to participate and, and observe the process and be able to go back and share what happened throughout the options development phase with the steering committee at large. Um, the Jacobs facility data that I mentioned just briefly is, is really the backbone of the planning. Um, it, it, it's the focal point that the, the feedback from the community serves to provide a framework for. And uh, in your Dropbox, very shortly in the coming days, you will receive an updated background report which will include that facilities information. I mentioned the options phase that we're in right now for the next two days. We're going to go through all of that data that I mentioned has already been collected and still being collected through the 6th. And we're, we're looking at that to organize it, kind of organize it into buckets or categories, if you will, so that we can uh, make it a little bit more digestible or, or organized so that we can then present that back to the steering committee. They'll take that work through the steering committee and start to synthesize the work so that they can then uh, create a, a draft facilities option packet that they will then work to provide back through that community dialogue process, gathering input back from the community through the individual questionnaire process or system and then the uh, group consensus process. And that'll be the very 1st of December, the 4th and 5th. We have two more dialogue sessions coming up, which will be the time that the, the input from the community is gathered around that options um, work. 
after we gather that feedback around the options, we're going to take that back. The steering committee will take that back and begin to create the recommendations that will ultimately be provided to you all in February. Uh, gentlemen, is there anything you'd like to add? Or? Thank you very much. Well, I look forward to joining you again in January where I can provide an update to this options phase, give you an update to the two steering committee meetings that are coming up in November and the December community dialogue meetings. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Do you have any questions? Mr. Rosenthal. Is there going to be another, did you say there's going to be another individual questionnaire coming out in the future? Yes, that will be at the uh, Community Dialogue 2, which okay. is December 4th and 5th. <clears throat> and do you have any way of tracking um, the, these responses? You know, I'm just looking at the questionnaire here, and uh, I guess the only real identifier kind of is, is what school you're identifying, you know, you, you're associated with or affiliated with. Yes, and if they do indicate that, the, the data can be sorted according to any of the demographics that they associated themselves with in responding to the questionnaire. And so if they are um, affiliated with a campus, then it can, it can be drilled down to that level. So. And do you allow multiple entries from the same IP address, or is that blocked? Or? It is possible that there could be multiple yeah. entries from the same IP Cause, address. Because I really do think that there is a real concern that certain groups with certain interests are hijacking this and uh, in fact one parent was bringing to a friend of mine at one of the community dialogues last week that they had 40 parents there all for that their one interest and yeah I don't know how you weed that out but I, I really think that knowing exactly where these responses are coming from maybe in the next one having people put their addresses down there so you could put all those responses on a map um, with a GIS program or something. And hearing that concern, I know we've had some discussion about that as well. Yeah, we, we found that in the past when we, when we restrict IPs, that then we have situations where people don't have enough access to it, where, oh, I want to fill it out, I want my wife to fill it out, all from the same computer, so we really can't do it that way. We, we find that asking people to identify themselves by school is really the best way to do it, because if we add the address, then we start to get into that anonymity kind of thing where we're losing that anonymity with the questionnaire. Um, what I like to do is if I, I look at the data and I see if I have an overwhelming response from an individual school or an area, I can drill down and say, okay, well, what do they feel? And then I can look at the inverse. Well, what does everybody ex except them feel? And so I can kind of see, you know, from that point of view where that is. And we can start to normalize it a little bit to try to get a, an idea of what the actual consensus is. We can we have about 300 come in on the paper dialogue and we can sort paper versus web and if there's a big delta between paper and web we can say okay well if there's a big discrepancy here perhaps we can look into it and see drill down by question by region by whatever to see if there is an anomaly we can we can note that and then see if we need to investigate further I would add to, I would add to, as we've talked about it even today, the fact is all of the survey data is going back to the whole steering committee and ultimately back to the whole community. So even if there's an attempt to kind of drive it a certain way, we're going to get feedback from the broader community. So in the end, we expect nearly a thousand survey out, you know, by the time this thing closes, a, a whole lot of people are going to respond to it. And it's going to take a whole lot of very intentional um, I guess saboteur behavior if someone really wants to drive it a certain way and I just don't know that they're going to be, have the capacity to do that well, at a level of, at a district level it's not just sab saboteur you know or, or hijacking it's you know 
we're, we're up here charged with the responsibility of looking at the entire district, the district as a whole. That's our jobs. And, you know, you can tell people, as I know you have at the beginning of those sessions, say you got to think of the district as a whole. But people are looking out. You know, there, there are groups of people that, that have one, one interest, you know, in their minds. And, and that really, again, it's not an attempt to sabotage the process. It's just they have one interest in mind, and that's, that's their main concern. And um, rather than actually following instructions and trying to look at the district as a whole. So. Any other questions? Mrs. James. Well, I'll just build on what you were saying, Dave. I think what you're, what you're saying is that we have to look out for those folks that are not represented in those community dialogue meetings and that are that those neighborhoods where there is not representation for whatever reason or those subpopulations that are not represented, et cetera, et cetera. So because when it eventually gets to us, we, we can't be just looking at individual or small groups. We have to look at the whole picture. And if we don't have data enough in the areas that are underrepresented, then we, we have to some, we still have to have that data. So we, we still have to have those, um, that, that, uh, those groups represented or those people represented and that those parts of the community represented. Um, our intention is in this first community dialogue, we have our demographics page and we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that we hit every avenue of demographics we need to. And if we don't in this process, we'll know where we're short. And then in the next community dialogue process, we'll make extra efforts to make sure that we engage those sections of the community that we may not have engaged in the first round. And, and to another layer to that is that when we go through the process, we, we do have data, of course, on all the facilities, and that's the Jacob study that <coughs> came out, and even I got a new, you know, some updates on that just a couple hours ago, and, and we're presenting that in the background report to you all shortly. And with the steering committee, it's going to be working through that for every school. Like, we're going to start, in, as Beth said, organizing all the data into buckets for the steering committee to, to consume and to help craft and draft and edit and refine the options which we bring to the community in the next dialogue. So that steering committee uh, membership helps to ensure that every school gets a careful eye. And we will look at that, look at the data within the steering committee for each school, and then we go to the community dialogue the next time the options that will be presented on the questionnaire will come from these work sessions. Every school will get its due, and then, uh, you know, obviously not every school is going to have proportionate in, um, uh, in participation on the dialogues or the web. Uh, but we do our best in this process through having steering committee, executive team here, through the community dialogues to get as many layers as possible to try to reach as broad as possible. But from what I understand, you don't have representative <coughs> representation from every school on the steering committee, or have I misunderstood that? We, there isn't representation from every school on the steering committee. There is not from every school. That would be rare in a district-wide master plan as well, uh, to have representation from every single school on a steering committee, um, just because of the sheer numbers it needs to work through that. Um, and, and so it's, it's an ideal, for sure, um, and, and we do our best through through the process itself, how it's structured to compensate for the fact that we're not going to always have proportionate reference, representation. Right. So I would guess that maybe in this process in the next couple of days you'll be filling in those gaps where we're missing the, the actual the people on, from the steering committee in those areas. I can those, note that. Mm -hmm. uh, parts of the community. This is helpful. How many people are on the steering committee? About. 100. There were about there were exactly 102 that were incorporated in the whole steering committee when we made the decision to stay with the larger group. There have been about 75, consistent. give or take a couple, who have been at both meetings consistently. And and on that committee, while they don't represent every school, there are representatives from each of the three areas. That is correct. correct. Is yeah. that an even number of representatives from each area? It is not. Planning area B is, is a little bit larger in their representation than A and C. Um, they have more, as we talked about before, they have more schools, more kids in the area, and they are a little bit larger than the other two areas. And the two people that you mentioned from each of those areas, they're representing then how many people? 
that they're, they're selected by the lottery. So how many, how many people were involved in that group? There were 16 people who put their names down to be involved in the lottery drawing. 16 of the steering committee members who put their name down to be a part of the drawing because they could attend the two sessions this week, tomorrow and Wednesday, and then the two sessions in December. And so if there's 75, say, they, then these two people represent about 20 or 25 people? Anywhere from 16 to 25 or 30, depending on what planning area. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other comments or questions? Just one clarification. After um, the options development meeting, we're going to meet for two days, and then I guess we're going to hear a report from that one. It's going to go back to the steering committee. Okay. We're going to have we're going to have two more steering committee meetings to further refine the options before. There's an options packet developed, and that, that options packet will go out before the community dialogue. And then also next week, uh, Tracy Richter will come in and be, provide an oral presentation. Uh, here's just look, much like we're doing and Beth did tonight to, kick, to describe the community dialogue. Tracy will describe the options development and where we are in that sense. So that's a good question. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Martinez, and thank you for your leadership in this area, and uh, Dion Richter, and also the E-Team, who I saw at Travis High School, working hard, staying late. That's right. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. You approve? All right. Next item on the information agenda is a update from Dr. Whitbeck. She's going to begin it, and then I think Dr. Moore is going to come and talk to you some more about accountability concerning the performance-based monitoring analysis system. <coughs> yes. Well, good evening. I know you're ready for another report, right? Mm -hmm. But I have to tell you that um, the good news is here because um, I get the privilege of opening with some hot, fresh, new good news from Texas Education Agency. And so um, in looking at the PBMAS, you know, the, the uh, performance monitoring system, uh, we, we have received various ratings over the past years. And last year, um, the district received several ratings that were in stages. And just to help remind you and clarify, the lower the number, the better. You really want a zero, four being the highest and what you don't want. And so we received um, just, what is it, I believe Friday afternoon, correct, Jan? Yes. We got um, notified that we have zero staging in career technical education bilingual ELL education and no child left behind. So that was exciting because we, during the on-site visit uh, a year ago they had found things that they wanted to see corrections and so those corrections have been made and now we are at stage zero. In addition, very exciting, in the area of special education we had been a stage three and now we're dropped down to a stage two. So that's an improvement. And in the residential tracker, which is looking at residential facilities, um, huge gains. We were a level four, and now we are level one. So um, everything's on the, on the uprise. Lots and lots of hard work um, helping to make that happen. And, and Don Carlson and Jan Moore are, are some of the reasons for that. So I'm going to turn it over to them, and they can give you an update on where we are with PBMAS. All righty, we're back with one more accountability system. I mean, we appreciate the time uh, that you've given us to share what has happened and what continues to happen in this area. First of all, I probably need to explain what it is. Um, Performance-based monitoring analysis system, those letters, everyone in the uh, district knows what those stand for now after our last couple of years experience. We're also going to share with you what the indicators are that our district is measured on, what caused our particular audit and the TEA visit from last January, what have we done since January to address it, and what will we be continuing to do during the year. Um, these are the letters. Performance-based monitoring analysis system is a way that TEA uses to monitor federally funded programs via desk audits. Some of you may remember the old DEC audits that went on. These occurred for most districts once every eight to ten years. And TEA would send in a team of monitors to district for weeks to look over our files, reports, 
et cetera, to make sure that we were in compliance with the guidelines for these programs. As we move to a more digital environment, our data is being sent regularly to TEA via our PIM submission and our state testing results. Our data is monitored, monitored against data from other districts, against state standards, against standards that are set. When any of the indicators are out of line, districts are informed and specific sanctions are issued. When those data reports are out of line in the same indicators over several years, TEA can decide to conduct an on-site visit and verify what is in place and what needs to be put in place to correct those problems. That is what happened last January for Fort Bend. The guiding principles of PBMAS are very briefly to improve our local performance. They are based in statutory law, so they are required. Um, they reflect critical areas of performance, program effectiveness, and data integrity. They help small districts be evaluated. We don't really play into that because we're such a large district. They have individual program accountability so that no tiny areas of performance anywhere can be masked or hidden. And they have extremely high standards. They are adjusted over time to ensure progress of a district toward the goals. The district program areas that we look at are bilingual education and English as a second language career and technical education, no child left behind, which is the academic profile that we look at, and special education. The district indicators, um, what you see up here are the indicators for each one of the program areas, and you can see that they have changed over the years. This is characteristic of the system. Sometimes we have an idea of a new indicator that's coming forward, sometimes we don't. Bilingual and ESL, there were eight indicators in the year 2012, and last year there were 10. Uh, CTE has increased two indicators from seven to nine in the last year. No Child Left Behind had eight indicators in 2012 and increased to 10, and SPED jumped five indicators from 18 to 23. Um, they change from year to year, and they usually change to represent something new coming into the system. For instance, uh, social studies was evaluated for the first time. We have not had that particular measure. Um, sometimes we'll, they'll focus on one indicator and the next year it will be completely written off. And the reason it's written off is because districts across the state are performing very well in that area. Sometimes they'll give us a report that includes a report only, no actual score, and that's sort of a heads up to us that they're going to put it on our system the following year. So we pay attention to that. There is a detailed manual that's released each year that clearly describes the specific, the specific calculations for each one of these. And we know exactly what data is used to, that we are judged by. So we have the data that we send to them. We have the formulas that we use. So we can pretty much predict exactly where we are. So why did we get audited? Um, our annual district report is released each September. You just heard Dr. Whitback refer to our newest one. It was a little late this year. Um, sanctions for scores come out about a month after that. And the sanctions are what we just got. Those are our staging. And they tell us very clearly what we have to do for each one of those program areas to improve. Um, district looks, or the TEA rather, looks at longitudinal data. Um, in our district for African American representation in special education, least restrictive environment percentages, ISS, OSS, and DAP numbers for SPED students' um, level of discipline. And then they looked in our district at our RF tracker. Dr. Moore, would you clarify what some of those acronyms are for the audience? I and sure the board can. Place? I apologize. ISS is in school suspension, a disciplinary approach. OSS is when their students are disciplined and they are sent home or out of school suspension. And DAEP is our alternative school for um, students that commit a crime that they need to be placed there. Um, so there's a large change in our district as well with our RF numbers, and this impacted their decision to conduct an online, vis or on-site visit. Um, 
they announced last fall about a year ago that they would be coming it was actually conducted the third week of january in 2013 once they come in they're looking to triangulate data they interview teachers they look at our files if we say something they find out that the same you know, the campuses should be saying the same thing so they're triangulating all of our data while they're here um, the initial report was first produced um, and made available to us in March and the final report was finally approved by TEA in July of 2013 so at this time I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Don Carlson director of special education services in Fort Bend ISD good evening as we discuss a corrective action plan and continuous improvement plan it's important to note that TEA has moved into the arena of integration of both the state and federal accountability systems and the integration of sanctions as well our new state accountability system that emerged this year has many new features lifted from the federal system this also means that while in our district TEA could examine anything and everything and they did so part of our correction corrective action plan established consistent district-wide procedures for monitoring and reporting the implementation of IEPs that include increased monitoring by campus and central office administrators Procedures have been developed which require monthly monitoring by campus principals to ensure that placement and services are being implemented on their campus. Monitoring is also being done regularly by staff within the special education department. We also develop proceed or we have been asked to develop procedures and imp implement a plan for training all staff on state assessment decision making for students with disabilities that includes data collection, data analysis, and how to document the decision in our paperwork. Campus staff and administrators were trained prior to school starting on state assessment decision making regarding students who take the STAR modified and how to document those decisions within the ARD paperwork. Conduct training for staff that includes the development of intensive programs of instruction for students with disabilities and conduct ARDs for students that develop these intensive programs of instruction. Training was conducted with every campus's special education department and all campus administrators regarding the intensive program of instruction. This is a program to support any special education student who did not pass the state assessment, either STAR or STAR modified. ARDS must be held to address the failures and an accelerated instruction plan, or AIP, must be put into place. The AIP is individualized for each student. Develop and implement a process that ensures CTE, the career and technical education, representatives are in place for ARDS, including secondary principal documentation on their campus, specific plans, and provide training. A process was developed and shared with all secondary administrators, special education staff, diagnosticians, and CTE staff. Procedures are in place for monthly monitoring to ensure that CTE teachers are attending ARDS. Develop reports for monitoring discipline referrals and placements for ISS, OSS, and DAEP by campus and district. Discipline reports have been created and run weekly to show disciplinary results by campus for ISS, OSS, and DAEP and broken down by race and ethnicity. Principals have to review their data and turn in a quarterly report as to how they are addressing any questions or concerns. Maintain clear documentation and develop procedures that ensure persons acting as parents for students are not employees. And this is part of our residential facilities tracker portion. Mm -hmm. Procedures are in place to assign surrogate parents to students in group foster homes. The focus is not whether a surrogate is an employee of Fort Bend ISD. It is ensuring that the surrogate parent is not an employee of the facility where the child is located. Maintain clear documentation of the assignment of surrogate parents within 30 days of knowing students need one. Establish monitoring procedures and train those involved. The district must monitor when a student arrives in a group foster home and assign a surrogate within 30 days of the student's arrival. Diagnosticians and campus staff were trained on procedures, monitoring, and training of surrogate parents. Conduct appropriate training sessions for surrogate parents and document and maintain training logs. New procedures were established and surrogates must turn in a log of participation when a student is with, withdrawn. Excuse me. Develop central office monitoring procedures to ensure specificity in frequency and duration documentation for related and instructional services. 
Frequency, duration, and location are specific to our related services, occupational therapy, OT, physical therapy, PT, um, vision for our visually impaired students, O&M, which is orientation and mobility, and then psychological services delivered by our licensed specialists in school psychology, LSSPs. And then also instructional services, which include speech and adaptive PE. Frequency speaks to how many times per nine weeks Duration is the length of the service, 30 minutes, 45, I mean 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes, and location is either pull out of general education or push in or inclusion into the general ed setting. The training focused on the specificity of each of the of each so that parents and others would know exactly when, where, and how services would be delivered. Develop central office monitoring processes to ensure newly developed guides related to specificity, frequency, and duration of services and are being consistently utilized on standard district forms. Logs were created for related services and instructional services. They are randomly monitored monthly by campus administrators and special education department staff and collected at each annual ARD. We are now switching over to our continuous improvement plan. Create a communication plan that addresses district-wide transition of students and share the PBMAS report. The district-wide communication plan is used to discuss all students, special education, limited English proficient or LEP, bilingual, and English as a second language ESL, and their transition between schools or the transition between levels, such as elementary to middle school, middle school to high school to ensure that school staff are aware and can implement services appropriately. This plan includes our administrative team meetings, ATM, principals meetings, directors meetings, etc. The PBMAS report was shared at the October principals meeting at all levels, elementary, middle school, and high school. All areas of concerns were discussed and how principals can assist to support the district's plan. Develop a plan of action to monitor the implementation of the curriculum audit recommendations. District members have been trained on how the audit was completed and how to interpret the findings. As this is a district level audit, a comprehensive plan will be created and rolled out with extensive communication with all stakeholders. Develop a special education parent training that includes training needed such as state assessment, disability awareness, and programs within the district. The district training is scheduled throughout the year to address state assessments, disability awareness, programs in the districts, and parents' rights. We were also asked to create a parent survey to collect feedback, and that survey is being completed this fall, and we will request feedback on how we can better support and inform our parents and students. Continue to ensure that campus plans for AU, currently now IR, improvement required, are aligned and being implemented. You've just heard from Ms. Macklin, principal of Briargate Elementary, regarding her plan, and all four AU campuses from last year met standards this year. Develop a comprehensive three-year training plan for all special edu education teachers regarding IEPs, their individual education plan. The special education part department worked with Stetson and Associates to develop a comprehensive three-year IEP training plan which was implemented beginning in the summer of 2012. The second year was implemented last summer 2013 and we will complete the three-year training this coming summer 2014. IEP goals are monitored to check for implementation of the training information. Develop an 18 plus program for life skills students. We are piloting an 18 plus program at one of our high schools. It focuses on vocation education, job training skills, and job placement. We will collect data and investigate expanding the program for the 2014-15 school year. Create a task force to develop a district-wide plan for reducing the overrepresentation of African-American students in special education. We have begun the plan for assessing our disproportionality of African-American students. Dr. Randy Sprick of Safe and Civil Schools presented to all campus administrators, and we are reviewing reports specifically to address proportion proportionality and disproportionality of race and ethnicity across the district. At this time, I will pass the plan to Dr. Lupita Garcia to address the final slide, which is part of the corrective action plan. Good evening. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Thank you. There it is. 
Um, the corrective action on this slide is written exactly um, as we received it. <coughs> it uh, says to address, um, develop procedures for addressing uh, advanced diploma rate, graduation rate, um, and options. So let me address that first. As I said, it's written exactly uh, as we received it. However, I need to clarify something uh, for you. And that is that we have one of the highest advanced um, diploma and graduation rates in the state and in the region. Uh, our last reported combined recommended high school program and distinguished achievement program graduation rates were 85% compared to 83% for the state and 81% for the region. So you say, well, what's, what's the deal here? Well, actually, um, what's uh, happened here is that this is referring to our graduation rates in these, both of these plans among ELL students and special education students. But we still have one of, like I said, overall highest rate in the state and the region. Also, our um, four year graduation rate is 92% compared to 86% uh, for the state and 85% for the region, which is seven, percent, seven percentage points higher for us. Again, that graduation rate is referring to those two populations. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we do have gaps here in these two populations and some work to do. The special education department, special services, the college career readiness department, curriculum instruction departments, we're all working collaboratively and meet frequently to discuss what we're doing and to make sure that we're aligned in our efforts to make those links a lot stronger. In terms of the four-year plans and the PGPs, uh, we are doing our due diligence to make sure that this is done. Um, I don't have any bragging things to say about that. We do have some issues with those and we're definitely working on them. During our three-day uh, Counselor Summer Institute that was held at the end of July and the first part of August, we trained all the secondary counselors on a very simple in-house, quote, homemade type of four-year plan system so that we could avoid having to do this paper and pencil. And we are do using it, although a lot of our campuses are still working on the paper and pencil model because it is just a very simple, quick fix uh, in an effort to ensure that every student ha has a four-year plan. Um, <clears throat> and we're hoping for a more comprehensive system. PGPs continue to be developed as they were last spring. This is a, a very time-intensive process for our counselors since the forms are not populated directly from a scholar. Presently, they still have to hand into the data for each PGP, gather information from teachers. There are five criteria for having what we call a solid um, in compliance PGP for every student. And um, that involves I information from the teacher as to what they're doing. It's not just we checked it off, we did this for the student, but what are we actually doing for the students uh, to ensure that they do graduate on time. So they gather the information from teachers and administrators, they document it, they include it all in the PGP, they, they send a letter to the parent, they schedule a PGP meeting with the parent, the parent comes in, they discuss that, the parent gets to discuss what their uh, hopes and dreams and goes off for their student as well as the student. We're anxious uh, for bringing forth a system that can alleviate some of this work for, for our counselors, especially populating the PGP form uh, uh, with information from Skyward. How many PGPs are we actually talking about? At the end of last year, we had uh, completed 4,500 PGPs. So that is a lot of PGPs. Um, the Hospital 5, however, has increased the scope of who must have a PGP. And so the work is still um, ongoing and in progress. Right now, our counselors are working diligently to uh, put together PGPs for all our sixth graders who just came in for fifth uh, grade, as well as for every new student to the district. So uh, it is uh, a continuous 
work in progress. It is not you do one PGP and you put it away and you forget about it. The actual law requires that we visit it frequently. We check progress of the students who have a PGP after each grading period. We contact parents. We continue to meet and monitor so that we have what I call no surprises for parents or students when the time comes. In terms of the, um, in regards to the development and guidance program, again, this summer during our institute, we begin to lay the groundwork for what we need to have in, uh, in terms of a developmental guidance program. This is a K through 12 developmental guidance program. Um, and um, we are, we started off by concentrating on college and career readiness lessons. Uh, this is a big initiative for us, but those are just a few of the strands for a comprehensive college and career readiness program. There's a lot of other things for the social emotional aspect of working with students. So uh, we still have work in this area and we plan to continue addressing this at our January 7th in-service meeting. Uh, we will have one day with the counselors and we plan to make full use of it to continue working on all these aspects. Thank you. And at this time, if anyone has any questions, we'll again be glad to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Moore. We have any questions? Mrs. Holmberg? Uh, it seems that in the corrective action plan that there's an increase in paperwork, there's an increase in ARDS, and there's an increase in monitoring and documentation. Do you agree with that? Yes. Well, it seems we might need an increase in staff in those areas because that falls to the teachers. In some cases, your special ed teachers, certainly, yes. um, for the paperwork, for attending the ARDS, your administrators that are pulled to attend ARDS. In some cases, it sounds like, I mean, it's a daily activity, several hours of their daily activity, which is amazing that they're sitting in a room. I mean, the ARDS are important, don't misunderstand me, but so are the other 15, 1800 kids out in the building. So I don't know if you have a plan for that, but personally, I don't know how the rest of the board feels about that. It sounds like if we're being forced to do that, we might need to look at um, some staff to help out. And the other thing um, you just mentioned about the PGP, that you look at every student's PGP after every grading period. I said there has to be a monitoring uh, process in place where, you know, the whole purpose of doing a personal graduation plan is to ensure that the student is on target and that we're also documenting our efforts, teachers, administrators, and counselors of how to assist the student uh, with intervention. So if we uh, do a PGP, we call the parent in and we sit down and we talk about the plan and the student continues to, to fail, then we, you know, that the, the goal is to look at it after grading period. I okay. can't say it was only about 100%. Incredible task to do. It is an incredible task. <laughs> I, I can't say that we're doing that 100% with fidelity sure. uh, because, uh, as you probably know, there are some campuses who have huge numbers of PGPs, whereas other campuses they do not. So it's very threatening. And we are required by this law or whatever it is to have a PGP for every student, are we not? Yes, the law went into effect in 2003. And under House Bill 5, um, uh, they increased uh, the amount of work and they redefined uh, the five aspects of a good PGP, which before they weren't really defined. And so they made it more definitive because a lot of districts weren't really implementing it the way it was intended to. It was more of a paper and pencil. We did it sign on the dotted line kind of thing. It's got teeth now. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Mr. Albright. I have just a couple. Um, I know we talked briefly about House Bill 5, and I'm a little concerned about referrals to ISS, OSS, and DAP as it relates to, since the state of Texas basically has decriminalized Class C misdemeanors on our campuses, what effect that's had on your referrals and your ISS and OSS and DAP process. Sure, I can answer that. Um, mm -hmm. Is nobody quantifying that data to see if we're experiencing increases in those areas because of that? I mean, somebody discipline has to go on in the school system, so somebody, 
So if you take away class, what was Class C misdemeanors, then I'm assuming that it's being referred back to administrators to to handle that problem. And I'm just wondering how they're doing that and, and, how, that and how that's going. That data is being monitored both by uh, Dr. McWilliams in the Department of Student Affairs as well as uh, in, in collaboration with Pam Kaminsky, our student attorney. So they are uh, monitoring that data and we can definitely provide you an update on where we are with that, but that is being monitored because that is of concern. Yeah, I'm, I'm not real concerned about, you know, month to month, but it might be quarter to quarter or something like that. Just how we're doing against this year versus last year. Yes, sir, and that's definitely and, something they are monitoring. Because we need to know, I mean, if they're going to come back and say, well, you know, we told you you needed to do this and you gave us a correction, a corrective actions plan, and now you have more referrals, you have more ISS, you have more OSS, so we need to know if that's what's causing that. So we can say, hey, okay, you told us we can't do this anymore, and so what do you expect us to do? be able to add just a little bit too um, with regard to um, a child being given a ticket as they refer to it for a class C most often at, in high schools at least my experience as a high school principal they would get the ticket in addition to whatever the campus was it going to do. Anyway. It would not have served as its only purpose. Okay. The two, like for example, if it was an assault or a fight, you okay. call it with some, you know, a little bit of injury, then there, there would be a ticket in addition to being in the suspension. Procedures so I would not topic. predict that you will see a great difference, but okay. that's just my prediction and we, the, the jury's out. We have been looking at data though, um, actually just recently at the end of the nine weeks, how many children are in ISS, how many in OSS, how many in DAEP, JJAEP. We actually have just really looked at that and we're um, uh, talking with our assistant superintendents too to have them be able to have those real good crucial conversations with principals. So we're all kind of uh, working as a team to monitor that and to talk about that and well, see how we can help. One of my areas of concern is, this, and it hasn't been this year, but in years past I've heard from the teachers that the principals have told them not to send referrals, you know, at different times, you know, because it makes the campus look bad. And <laughs> I understand that, but I'm assuming that we're past that point. But anyway, I'd just like to see data to that effect. Any other questions, Mr. Alcrine? No, thank you. Okay. Hey, wait a minute, there's one more. Um, <clears throat> the personal graduation plan. Isn't uh, this new system that we're thinking about proposing, is it... Isn't it possible to program that um, on a quarterly basis or a nine-week basis, whatever the waiting period is, to to identify students who are not on plan? Yeah. Um, in terms of the the nine-week grades, uh, you know, those we would get from the report cards. In terms of um, sending out red flags and alerts to students who are not on target because they're either not in a course or failed a class at the end of the year, yes. Yes, I would be able to do that. Okay, so on a so on a grading period basis, that's not a that's not a workable deal, but on a on a sick on a mid year or yearly basis it is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not sure that, that we couldn't do it for a grading period, but we more counselors are uh, well I'm just thinking that you know you can only assign so much work to people right. and say it's going to get done and then <laughs> if, it's, if it's being done versus you know a printout that runs and says here you need to check right. with these kids because there's a problem right well actually we do get fail failure reports at the end of every grading period so we we get them alphabetically by counselor by grade whichever way we want them and so mm -hmm. that is not the issue the the biggest issue is as Mrs. Solomon said is the human element the time that that you have to to spend calling in the students, calling in the parents. It's more the human element than well, the you had to point out you can't get around that. Well, those are, what you're referring to, I believe, are just the simple printouts of who's failed as opposed to the development of the plan. Well, I just want to be sure that some, that our students don't fall through the cracks because nobody's saying to them, hey, look, we're looking at your grades and we're looking at your plan and we're not matching up. Right, that's what the PGP, the personal yeah. graduation plan, is supposed to accomplish. And whether we do that at the end of every grading period, at the end of the semester, or at the end of the year, you know, that just depends on the severity of the student uh, and what they're failing. 
I think it's important because it's listening to this conversation and you know we've we wanted to bring you up to date on this audit because this is important information it's been here a while you haven't heard about it in detail mm -hmm. but even talking about something like the PGP and the reporting and the meetings I think we always have to keep in mind and I'm, and I'm not suggesting you do not or anybody does not we're talking about students here and we're talking about like you've already acknowledged overworked teachers who have, to implement, who have to implement systems to support students. And so these are findings, and we have a corrective action plan, but the real issue at hand is developing a culture and a systemic approach to doing all of these things so they happen naturally, and, and the conversations are natural and organic, right. and, and, and based on true care and concern for the student's progress, not simply because this report says, I have to talk to you now, I've, I've done that for this semester, so going back to class, gotcha. because that can happen. <laughs> Those things can happen yeah, if, if we're not careful. So this truly is about us working organizationally to support teachers. Well, number one, to support principals, to support teachers, to support students and their parents. And so I think that's the intent. I, want, I don't want us ever to lose sight of that. And But frankly, a lot of this happened because this district did not have systems in place to address these things. Okay. So, the, so we're right now we're in the um, jump through the hoops compliance mode to just get these things done. But the big picture is the culture shift and transformation right. that is to follow where this stuff will not be an issue because it's part of, it's just what we do, what we do. to support our children in Fort yep. Bend ISD. Thanks. That's a good way to frame it. Thank you. Um, Superintendent Dupree, that's very accurate. I, I also want to say, just to add one more thing to that. Um, through the PGP, the parent involvement is critical. I think we all agree that we cannot do it our, by ourselves. Not so it right. makes the parent very aware. What is the parent willing to commit? We have it in writing, and so we're all a team. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments, Mrs. James or Mrs. Bailey? Right. Yes. Okay, I have kind of a basic question. Back in one of the slides where there were a lot of acronyms, what is an RF tracker? RF tracker is residential facilities tracker. Okay. And, and it talks to um, residential facilities, day treatment facilities. However, we do not have either of those within our ISD boundaries. Um, but we do have group foster homes. And so those are encompassed within that. And so when we're looking at it, we're looking at our foster care kiddos that are in group foster homes. Okay. And so when we're, I don't know if this is right. So when we're looking is that that's part of the special ed in in that set of indicators that this came up is part of the special ed or is that a separate category it well it's a little bit separate but it's all encompassed within pbmas because it's all integrated um, but we're looking specifically at our foster students who are special ed not the foster students that do not qualify because there's obviously both in, in homes. There's there's general ed students and special ed students, and so we focus on the special education students and ensure that they are receiving all their placement and services that have been audited. Okay. In this that system, it just falls out as a separate indicator. Okay. As one of the special ed indicators, it's a more specific one right. targeting those in residential facilities. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, I think I might understand that. I might follow that. Okay, and um, I would like to follow up on what Ms. Homom said. Looking at all these uh, corrective actions, there seems to be um, a tremendous need for personnel. I, I, I'm not even sure. I mean, these are covering a whole, it seems like a whole range of the special ed department and really the whole campus in some cases, as you said, the administrators and so forth. So I know we've talked about that before in budget time and maybe uh, in the late spring. I'm not sure what happened to some of that, but um, that might be something we need to definitely revisit because um, this looks like a tremendous um, addition and, and not that it, I mean, it just is some things that have fallen through the cracks maybe because of lack of manpower. We just can't keep up with it all. So it's kind of well, the feeling I was getting. And that's kind of triangulated by the level of concerns we get from staff. I mean, we have several communication venues, um, channels, and, and so this is where we hear that and what we hear from staff. 
Okay, and then the last thing I'd like to say is that it sounds like you've made tremendous progress already in the, le in the short months since the report came out. And I know several of you that are working on this are new. Some have been around a while, but it seems like there's been tremendous progress made. So I'd just like <coughs> to commend you for working so hard to make that progress and look forward to great reports uh, in the future. Thank you, Dr. Moore for a very comprehensive report. Dr. Carlson, Dr. Garcia, uh, would it be appropriate to take a 10 minute break at this point in time? If there are no objections. We, the time is now uh, 7.37. We'll take a 10 minute break. Thank you.